Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. Okay? We're going to read together in count of three, yeah? One, two, three. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning thought and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So I have uh, two things that I want to accomplish tonight. First, uh, what we usually do every week, I'm going to explain to you what these verses actually meant to the original audience and then how it applies to us. So that's what we do every single time I preach. That's normal. But I have another agenda in mind. Another agenda that I have in mind, I want to explain to you why we do what we do. Especially in one thing, why do we preach the word the way we preach the word? Because it's important for you to know. If this is your home, if you call this place your home, you need to know what we believe. So tonight I have two agenda. At the same time, I will explain to you what the verses mean. But at the same time, I want to give a specific application just for Roxy International. What does this mean to us? You with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you um, for the word of God. And... Um, because we know the Word of God has power to transform life as we have sang throughout the day earlier all in all the song that the very Word of God has the power to transform us even right now Lord as we read your Word together even if we have yet to fully understand it we believe that the Word of God is already transforming our mind making us more and more like Jesus and that's the reason why we're here we are here not because we want to hear someone talk but we are here because we want to hear the Word of God because we, when we encounter the Word of God, we know that our lives are transformed to be like the Word of God in flesh. And that's what we desire. That's what we want. So help us tonight, Holy Spirit, because without your help, everything that I'm going to say means nothing. But with your help, with your power, there will be life that we transform tonight. So we ask this, that you do what you only can do, transform us to be like your son. Thank you. We believe, we receive it by faith. In the name of mighty Christ, we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. So today, we, today we're going to only tackle two verses. Some of you are like, yes, short sermon. Wait, not yet. You know, you never know because this is the scriptures that I, as your pastor, hold very dear in my heart. So I, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for the time that I can preach this. So now the time is finally here. You know, you got, you got to be... I can't promise you a short sermon. I know it's just two verses, but we'll see how long it's going to take. And plus, I'm probably having a bit of fever. I might go all over the place, so it might be an hour sermon long. You never know. But I want to talk about one thing. Let me ask you to start a question. What makes a church a church? So just think about it. What makes a church a church? So in your opinion, what makes a church a church? Now, it is important for us to know the answer to this question. Because we live in a day and age where there are many places that are called church, but they are not church at all. Okay, I know this is harsh, but let me tell you. There are many places out there that have praise and worship like us. They sing a song, they lift our hand, and then they listen to this, some kind of talk, and they call themselves church. But let me tell you, if I can be honest with you, they're not church. Because they're missing one important trait that every church must have. Okay? Uh, the Bible has a lot of different traits for what makes a church a church. But there is one trait that governs every other trait. Now, if you have this trait right, then every other trait will follow. But if you do not have this trait right, then you can have all the other elements of what makes the church church, but it will come to nothing. So I want to talk to you about this one very specific trait that makes a church a church, that makes a church distinct from every other social organization out there, Okay. Um, in my preparation for the sermon, I listened to a pastor who gave a list of what things people look for in a church, okay? This is a list. I'm going to read you the list and try to think about it. Yeah, this is what the common list, what people look for in a church, okay? The question would be like this. Does the church have a good parking? Okay. Are the seats comfortable? Are the bathroom clean? Are the kids program good? Are the people in the church like me? Does the song suit my taste of music? Is the pastor cool? Are the sermons engaging? Are they short? Okay. Let's try to answer it using our church. Okay. Let's try to answer it using our church. Okay. This is my answers. Okay. My answers. You might, you might disagree with me. Okay. My answer would be it goes like this. Okay. Do we have a good parking? I would say yes since I park downstairs. 
But um, I heard some of you give up on parking, you know, and leave, ended up leaving the church. But Are the seats comfortable? Yes, except the broken ones. Are the bathroom clean? Praise God for Pastor Lydia and Kailu. Are the kids' program good? What kids' program, right? Are the people in the church like me? As far as I can see, all of us have black hair. Some of us have fake non-black hair, but all of us have original black hair. So, yeah, the people are like me. Uh, what about this one? Like, does the song taste fit my taste of music? Mine? Yes. Yours? I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure we can all agree on the next three questions. Is the pastor cool? Definitely. Are the sermon engaging? Of course. Are they short? Yes, compared to the morning service. Okay? So, that's, that would be my answer. Okay? That would be my answer. Okay? Um, all of these things that we just talked about, they're a nice thing that a church can have. They're a nice thing. Like, of course, you want to have a good bathroom, you want to have a good kitchen, you want to have a comfortable place, great music. That's awesome, and that's, that's good. But they're not what makes a church a church. Now, let me tell you, I'm, I'm going to give you my answers now. And you, when you hear my answer, you like, Bleh. that's common sense. But let me tell you what the answer is. What makes a church a church? What makes church this thing from every social organization out there? is the biblical preaching of the Word of God. Now, some of you are like, well, every church has a biblical preaching. Now, here's my argument. Okay, I'm going to be very harsh. Unfortunately, no. You will come to a lot of places today, a lot of places that have some kind of sermon, some kind of preacher, and the preacher is excellent. They're funny, they're engaging, they're energetic, they can make you laugh, they can make you cry, and at the end of the you feel like, oh, I feel being touched, I'm touched by the Spirit. They can do that, they can control your emotions in such a way that you feel like, wow, the, the Spirit of God really speaking to me. But let me tell you, at the end of the day, they're not preaching the Word biblically. And what makes a church this thing from every other organization is biblical preaching of the Word. Now, let me give you a definition of biblical preaching of the Word, okay? This is my own definition of biblical preaching of the Word. Can we have it? Biblical preaching is speaking for God by exposing the people of God to the written Word of God in its context. Let me read that again. Biblical preaching is speaking for God by exposing the people of God to the written of God in his context. Now, does that mean it's wrong for a pastor, a preacher to be engaging, to be funny, to be emotional? No. I'm not advocating the kind of sermon that leads you into God's rest while you're listening to the sermon. Inside joke. Some of you understand, some of you don't. I'm not advocating that kind of sermon. I'm not advocating that kind of sermon. So yes, you can be engaging. You can be funny. You can grab people's attention. But at the end of the day, are you preaching what the Word of God actually says? Because that's what makes the church this thing from every other organization. You can have all this encouragement, motivation talk, but if it's not the Word of God, then it is not a church. Sorry to say. So what makes us different from every other places out there is the biblical preaching of the Word. Now, that's why I'm a big fan of expositionary expositionary biblical preaching. Now, what I do not mean by expositionary is this. That means you have to read, I have to teach first by first every single word. I do not mean that. Because I've been to many churches, I listen to a lot of sermons that explain the Bible first by first, but they explain it the way they want to explain it. They explain it according to their own agenda. They explain it according to their own understanding, with ignoring the context of the first, what the first said before that, the first after that, and the context of the whole book. So they just use the first and explain according to their understanding. This is not biblical preaching. And I also do not mean that if you want to preach expositionary, you cannot preach topical. I do not mean that. You can preach topical. You can preach on parenting. You can preach on dating. That means you have to grab first from here and there. That's normal. But you have to use it within its context. You are free to pick and choose verses of the Bible, but you're not free to change the context. That's biblical preaching. Are you with me? Now, let's go back to the book of Hebrew. Okay, now, I'm, ju- I'm just giving you the illustration. Now, we're going to go back to the book of Hebrew, and we're going to look what the book of Hebrew says about uh, biblical preaching. But before that, let me give you one illustration. This illustration really stuck in my head. It's by David Platt. David Platt said there are three ways, there are three ways, we can use the Word of God in the sermon, okay? The first way, 
The first way is we treat, uh, this is in the context of a swimming pool, by the way. The first way is this, we treat the Word of God like a diving board. Yeah, so you get into the diving board, you do, you get into the diving board, and then you jump. And you jump into the pool, you swim, and you totally forgot about it, right? You never return to it. So that's one way you can use the Bible. You, uh, you jump over into the pool, and then you ignore it. Quack, not yet. Why are you showing that? Okay? You jump into the diving board, you use that as a diving board, and you jump into the pool, and then you totally ignore it. That's the first way, the first way you use Scripture. Basically, begin with the first, and then after that, whatever talk the preacher wants to say. Second way you use the, the Scripture is you treat it as a pool furniture. So you jump into the pool, and then you swim, and you take a knot. Yeah, all right? All right, James, I'll see you there. Paul, yeah, I take notice of you. So they use verses of the Bible, that, that, but they never explain it, and they never go back to the context, the original context. They just use it the way they want. They, uh-huh, i see you there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. But the third way we use the Scripture, and that's the way we do is this. We treat the Scripture, the Word of God, as the swimming pool. So we jump into it, and we swim in it. That's biblical preaching of the Word of God. And that's what essentially I try to do every single week. I'm trying to take all of you guys to swim with me. Let's swim in the Word of God. Let's immerse ourselves in this Word of God. Now, does that mean every preacher has to have the same style? No. You can do, what's this, freestyle. You can do breaststroke. You can do backstroke. You can do butterfly. You can do the rock style. I don't know. Whatever it is. But the point is this. The point that you immerse yourself in the Word of God. Are you with me? The point is that you get into the Word of God, read it, understand it, and see it there. Now, that's what I'm trying to do tonight. So tonight, we're going to go for a swim in two verses that Hebrew gave us. Now, let me give you the context. Remember the context from last week? is this. The, um, the order of Hebrew is telling the church in Hebrew, I want you to enter God's rest. Now, if you forget what God's rest is, it's not sleeping. God's rest is actually enjoyment, delight satisfaction, gladness at everything that the Lord has done. So even in the midst of chaos, you feel refreshed, you feel joy. That's God's rest. And the order of Hebrews says this, come on, come into God's rest. Enter into God's rest. Do not be like the Israelites. They cannot enter God's rest because of their unbelief. But I want you to believe. I want you to trust Christ. I want to jump into the pool and swim in it. And then, now in verse 12 and 13, the book, the order of Hebrews is going to give us the reason why the Word of God is very important for you to enter God's rest. What role does the Word of God have in order to enable you to enter God's rest? Are you with me? Now, three points. First, the one that Kwok Harry has shown you. The Word of God is living and active. Second, the Word of God penetrates us. And third, the Word of God exposes us. First one, the Word of God is living and active. We find it in verse 12. It says this, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay, stop there. So this is the first thing that the author of Hebrews said, that the Word of God is living and active. What does it mean? Can we agree that the Bible is written by dead men? Can you agree? The Bible has 66 books written by 40 different authors throughout 4,000 years, and all of them are dead today. So the Bible is written by dead men, yet it, the order of Hebrew says this, the Bible, the Word of God is alive and active. Why? Because even though the Bible is written by dead men, at the same time, it is written by the Holy Spirit. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we talked about, therefore the Holy Spirit says, Hebrew 3 verse 7, is actually quoting Psalm 95, which was written by David. But yet the order of Hebrew does not say David say, but say what? Holy Spirit Say, so at the same time, even though the Bible is written up by that man, all 66 of them are inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is the very Word of God Himself. Now, my question is this. Do you know what the Word of God can do? Do you know the power of the Word of God? Do you know what it means for the Word of God to be living and active? Let me just give you one picture. In the beginning, Genesis said, there was nothing. And then what did God do? God spoke, and what happened? Poof! Universe happened. That's the power of the Word of God. The power of God has the power to accomplish what it's set out to do. It's very different from our word. Okay? When we use our word, the best thing that we can do with, with our word is to command something. 
command someone. Correct? Let me give you an example. When you wake up in the morning, you said, let there be light. Do you know what will happen? Nothing. Unless you have Jarvis. Good morning, sir. Let there be light. Okay? Unless you have Jarvis, that will be happens. Okay? That's Iron Man, by the way. Some of you, who's Jarvis? Okay? <laughs> but if you're not Tony Stark, what you have to do if you have to walk to the switch and flick on the light. So the best thing that you can do is command something to happen, but someone else needs to do it. Agree? For example, you can go to your home tonight and say, Mom, Indomie. First thing that will happen to you is my mom, your mom probably will slap you in the face. All right? I'm not your slave, okay? And the second thing that might most likely probably happen if they're nice, if your mom kind, your mom will make you Indomie. But your word, the best that it can do is command someone else to do it. But it has no power to do anything on its own. Agree? But when God speaks, when God speak, phew, universe happen. The best picture of this is what happened when Jesus encountered Lazarus. Now, if you don't know what Lazarus is, read John verse 11. Beautiful story. Let me give you the summary. So one day, a messenger came to Jesus and said, Jesus, the man that you love is really sick. It's Lazarus. So, but the funny thing that happened, instead of coming, approaching Lazarus as soon as he can, he decided to stay two days behind. So he decided to stay behind. And when he got to Lazarus, it's the Bible says that Lazarus was dead four days. How many days? Four days. Not four hours, not 40 minutes. It's not as if, you know, Lazarus was unconscious and then went to heaven and then he looked at heaven and then he came back to earth and wrote the best-selling book about heaven. No, that's not what happened with Lazarus. Lazarus was dead, fully dead, Four days. And then Jesus came. He showed up. And he said three words. Lazarus, come out. And then the Bible said, Jesus walked into the tomb, give CPR, and try to resurrect Lazarus. That's not what happened. The moment Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, that very same word, that very same word of God enters into Lazarus' corpse, enters into Lazarus' dead body, bring life into that corpse. So Lazarus opened his eye. He see, he walk out of the tomb. The word of God is living and active. Whenever the word of God sets out to do something, it will accomplish it. I love the word, the way Isaiah put it. Isaiah put it this way. Isaiah 55, verse 10 to 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sour and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. Listen, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. So this is Isaiah confident. When the word of God leaves God's mouth, it will accomplish accomplish what it set out to do without fail. It's one beautiful story. Uh, when I first heard the story, I was laughing. It's really funny. It's by David Platt. So David Platt tells a story um, of how a missionary uh, went and preached the gospel, and then he encountered this man on the street. Right? This, the man was uh, smoking a cigarette. So um, this missionary shared the gospel with the guy, and eventually after a while, the guy said, huh, you know, the paper in the book that you're holding, it looks like it's good for me to, sm- um, to roll a cigarette and smoke through it. And the missionary is offended. This is the Word of God. This is the Bible. How can you think about making it a cigarette? But then he thought, you know what? Huh, this might be a good opportunity. So the missionary make a deal with the guy. So he says this, okay? Okay, you like the paper? Okay, I'm going to give this book to you. Okay, he's carrying a New Testament Bible. I'm going to give you this book. Promise me, before you roll it into cigarette, that you will read what it's written on the page first. And the guy, all right, I can do that. The paper's good. It's worth it. Okay, I can do that. Okay? So the, new, the missionary gave him the New Testament Bible. Okay? And then, long story short, a few days later, or weeks later, I don't know how many days later, the missionary happened to encounter the guy again. And the missionary asked the guy, dude, did you keep your word? And the guy said, Okay, this is his word. Uh, this word, he's really funny. I'm going to quote him. And this is, he said, the guy responded, I read and smoked my way through Matthew. So what he did is he rolled, he rolled the paper and he made a cigarette and then he smoked through. Okay? I, read, I, I read and smoked my way through Matthew. Then I smoked my way through Mark, Luke, and all the way to John chapter t- 3. 
Then I read verse 16, and suddenly it dawned on me that God loved me, that God sent His Son to earth to save me. So I gave my life to Jesus. I put my trust in Him, and I decided to follow Him. Do you know how that happened? He smoked his way to New Testament. That's crazy. I'm like, that's insane. And uh, to add cherry on the top, right now, today, the man who smoked his way to New Testament, he's on training to become a pastor. That's crazy. Now, do you know? Do you know that that's the word of God can do? Do you believe that's the power of the word of God? That the word of God right now has the fiery power to transform anyone's life. It is not limited by your limitation. It's not limited by your weaknesses. It's not limited by someone's hardness. If God sets out to do something, if the words want to do something, it will accomplish it. Now, hear me. Hear me on this. Therefore, the Bible is always, always relevant. Do not believe the lie that says the Bible is not relevant today. That we need to change the Bible. We need to edit the Bible. Because that's the world that we live in. The world says the Bible today is not relevant. That's why we need to change it. But let me tell you good news. The Bible has been under attack ever since its creation 2,000 years ago. The Bible has been under attack ever since the first century. People try to change the Bible. People don't like the Bible. Even though it's... Tear apart, it's still my Bible. People don't like the Bible, but what I know about the Bible, even though 2,000 years, every single attack come, every single attack go, come and go, come and go. But let me tell you what still remains 2,000 years later. This word still remains. Why? Because it is the very word of the eternal God who say, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I will not change. Therefore, my word will not change. My word will always be relevant. There will be not a day that my word will cease to be relevant. The word of God is relevant for you and me, every situation. That's why Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40 said this, that the grass wither, the flower fade. But what? But the word of God, what? But the word of God, what? Everything come and go. Your parents come and go. Trouble come and go. Every situation come and go. Every attack come and go. But one thing that we know for sure will never ever come and go is the word of God. It is the eternal word of God unchanging yesterday, today, and the same forever. You know, I guess, you know, you guys are not very charismatic. You know, if you're black, just wait, come on, preacher, preach it. Okay. <laughs> and that's not just organ. Like, Woo! And like, okay. I blame that to my sickness. <laughs> All right. The first thing that we need to understand is the Word of God is living, active. It will not fail to accomplish what it set out to do. It is the eternal Word of God. The God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The second thing that we see in these verses, not only is living and active, the second thing that the Word of God does is the Word of God penetrates us. When I read in verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thought and the intention of the heart. So the second thing that the author of Hebrews said about the word of God, it, it, it not only has the power to do whatever it wants to do, it is extremely sharp. It is extremely sharp, sharper than any two edges for it. I mean, it has no blunt side. Whatever side that the Word of God hits you, it's sharp. It's like a hot knife cutting through a warm butter. It's like, bruh. And the idea of putting joint and marrow, soul, and spirit, the order of Hebrew is not giving the anatomical analysis of human being. What he's trying to say is a poetic say saying, there's nothing in you that the Word of God cannot cut. There's nothing in you that the Word of God cannot cut. And the Word of God will cut you. And the Word of God will cut you. But the good news is this. Whenever the Word of God cut you, it cuts in order to heal you. But it's painful. And what more beautiful than that, the Word of God able to discern the thought and intention of your heart. What does it mean? Have you ever realized sometimes that we do good things with, with a bad intention? Have you ever realized that? Or even let me push it further than that. We do good things with bad intention and we're not even aware of our bad intention. Are you with me? But the, the order of you say, the word of God is able to cut through it and reveal the deceitfulness of sin. A few weeks ago, we talked about deceitfulness of sin. How sin always lied to us saying, you're okay. 
you're fine. You don't need other people. You're good. But we need other people to tell us. And they hear today, we need the word of God to show us. Let me give you an illustration, okay? Um, last week, last week was a very tough week for me. So what happened on Saturday morning, uh, Saturday morning, someone banged at my front door. Bang, 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 bang. And um, I was upstairs, and Ilu opened the door, and the guy gave her a stack of paper. Bam. And I don't know what they're talking about, but I heard my name being mentioned. I was upstairs, I can't bother to go down. All right, so he came, oh, Yoshia, Yoshia, Yoshia? Okay, no problem. So I took shower, I do my stuff, and then I need to leave the house. Before I leave the house, I remember, oh, yeah, there's something for me. So I went to the kitchen and looked at this stack of paper put in the kitchen, and it has my name in it, okay? And when I read it, it says I've been sued by local court of New South Wales for $14,300, okay? $14,300, I'm like, ah! Are you serious? I'm like, what did I do? Did I kill anyone? So I, lo- I read the paper and I found out it was from accident that happened on February. So I was involved in minor accident on February. I hit someone else's car. But I thought um, the insurance already taken care of it. We already report everything. It's taken care of. Fine, no big deal. But out of nowhere, I received a letter saying, you know, statement of claim saying, I owe this person $14,300. And I'm like, this is insane. So what I did is I, I texted my future lawyer and I began to have conversation with uh, my future lawyer. And, uh, and, and my future lawyer, being a good lawyer, he, is, he said, uh, I'm not actually supposed to advise you on what to do, but I will tell you anyway. Well, thanks, Josh. All right. So he... He advised me on what to do, so uh, he told me the first thing that you need to do is draft a letter, you know, complain to this person, what the heck is wrong with you? Well, in a nicer way, though. Don't say that, but okay, pretty much what, what's happening. And then the second thing that I have to do is I have to um, call my insurance and find out what happened. All right, technically, okay, that's fine. But the problem is it's Saturday. That means insurance closed. I have to wait till Monday, and not even Monday, I have to wait till Tuesday because the insurance under my parents' names, and my dad will be back on Monday night. So... Throughout the weekend, I have to live with this $14,300 in my, at the back of my mind, okay? And I try to ignore it because I have a big weekend, okay? If you do not know, that weekend on Saturday, we have RSI volleyball. So that means I'm about to go and play volley. And at night, they have Apple Lock, which I have ticket for. But I can't go now because I also have to preach two sermons on Sunday. So last week, I was preaching in the morning and... Night, two different sermons, not the same sermon. That means on Saturday, I have a lot of sermon preparation to do. And on top of that, I have 3,000 words essay due Monday midnight, which I haven't started writing. Now, can you imagine the way what I felt on Saturday? It's crazy. So when I play volleyball, yeah, it, it, it distracts me a bit. But whenever I have a chance, it's like, ah, oh, $14,000. <laughs> <Right? laughs> yeah, it's, it's somewhere there. It's always there. And then, Okay, after that, I have, okay, I can't go to the epilogue, and then I have to go home. I have to prepare for the sermon. And when I do my sermon preparation, okay, I read my Bible. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. And, 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 you know, it, it seems like, you know, 14,000 keep waving their hand at me. Hi, I'm here. Hi. I'm like, okay, okay, ignore you, ignore you. Okay, I'm just going to do my essay. Okay. Maybe if I do my essay, because essay takes a lot of, you know, concentration. I'm going to do my essay. And when I try to do my essay, it's like 3,000 words, 14,000 dollars, 3,000 dollars, 14,000 dollars. It just does not work. So finally, I said, you know, stop it. I'm just going to go to sleep. So I turned off my light at 11 o'clock and went to bed. I try not to think about $14,000, but how many of you know it's impossible to not think about $14,000? If it has one less zero, more, maybe possible. But because it has $14,300, even though I try not to think about it, at the back of my mind, subconsciously, it keeps you know, coming back somehow. And I ended up not being able to sleep at all. I only slept for half an hour that night. And then there's also UEFA Championship League. And then I have to and then preach in the morning. Right? I preach in the morning. I was on fire because that's pretty much all my energy that I have left. But in the evening service, in the evening service, this is what happened. Do you remember what I preached on last week? Rest. Entering God rest. What is God rest? God rest is where, even though the world around you might be chaos, you'll be able to sleep and refresh and find joy in God. And I'm like, yeah, I'm only sleeping for half an hour, and I'm preaching on God's rest. And when we come to that first, this beautiful first, and Hebrew first, first nine, Hebrew four, first nine, this very word. When I was preaching to you, it. 
cuts into my heart. This is what he says, for then there remain a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work as God did from his. This is what happened to me. I was preaching to you guys. Come on. God's rest available to you. Come, join. He wants you to rest in him. Yet, myself, the word of God reveal, you see, you have unbelief in your heart. You think $14,000 bigger than me. You have not entered my rest. You, you, you don't trust me. You think your problem is bigger. That's why all throughout the day, you've been thinking about it. You've been worrying about it. And the word of God cuts me. Not because it's evil. It cuts me in order to reveal my sinfulness so that I can find my rest in Christ. Even a preacher, as they preach, the word of God is sharp enough to cut them. The word of God is sharp enough. But then, what's scary about this verse is this. Okay? What's scary about this verse is it's able to cut through anything. Okay? Some of you are wondering, what happened to the 14,000 story? Call? You can ask my lawyer after the service. <laughs> he will tell you what happened. But the Word of God, the next part is a bit scary. So the first thing, the Word of God is living and active. It, accomplish, it will accomplish what it's set out to do. The second thing is, the Word of God is able to cut through anything, even all your being. It can cut through your heart. It's not limited by anything. But the third thing is, is the Word of God exposes us. Let's read in verse 13. That's why it's saying in verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, whom we must give account. Make a long story short. This is what I say. God knows. He knows. Even the very thing that you don't want anyone to know, even the very intention that you were not even aware that it exists, even that very thing it says is, God knows. And the other Hebrew now changed the picture of the word of God and put a metaphor of the eyes of God. God, God sees you might be able to trick your closest friend. You might be able to trick your parents. You might be able to trick your spouse. You might be able to trick your pastors. You might even be able to deceive yourself to think that that thing that not exists. But let me tell you, you cannot fool the Word of God. It exposes everything about you. Now, I love the word expose. Why do I love it? Because the word expose in Greek is different, okay? The word expose in, in Greek is the idea of utterless helplessness. Okay, the word is used actually in a wrestling match. Anyone love WWE? Okay, people back in my days, we loved them, right? Like, I used to love WWE. It's like one of my favorite sports until finally one day I realized, how can get this guy get beat up in the face every time and never bleed? You know, it's like, boom! Boom, boom, and, he, and finally you find, oh, that's the leg. That's not actually the hand that's <laughs> doing the punch. It's actually the leg. Oh, okay. And, but, you know, even though I know it's narrated and it's lie, I still love it. All right? <laughs> if you smell... Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay. Um, there's two ways that you can lose in WB, okay? There's two ways that you can lose. Okay, the first way, the first way that you lose in a WB wrestling match is um, if you get smacked down. Okay, if you get DDT or something like that, if you get smacked down by your opponent, and then the ref will go, one, two, three, and if the three count, you're still unconscious, you still can't do anything, you lose the game. But the second way that you can lose the match is this. The second way that you can lose the match is that if your opponent lock you in such a way that you are helpless, you can't do anything, and all you can do is what? Tap. That means I surrender. That's the word that the, Hebrew, the author of Hebrew used, exposed. It means utterly helpless in a wrestling match. So what does it mean? It means that, that the word of God locks you in such a way that you don't even have any excuse anymore. All you can say what God is doing, I cannot, I cannot. Whatever excuse that you can come to try to cover that thing, the word of God exposed it. You are fraud. You are a lie. And the word of God condemns you. Okay, so what, what the Word of God does is this. The Word of God cut you. The Word of God cut you. The Word of God exposed you. Now, that all that you can do in front of God is this. There's absolutely nothing I can do. I am utterly helpless inside of God. But the good news for those of you who trust in Christ is this. Remember, the sword is two-edged. Two-edged. One side of the sword cuts you. 
But for those who trust in Christ, the other side of the sword, sanctify you. What does it mean? It cuts the tumor out of you. It's like a surgeon with his scalpel that he needs to pierce through your body and then he needs to cut that tumor in order what? To save you. That's what the Word of God does. He penetrates into your heart, refills the sinfulness of your heart, your unbelief, and it removes it from you. It cuts you in order to heal you. That's the Word of God. Okay? Now I'm going to give you application. What does it mean to us as a church then? What does it mean for the Word of God to be this extremely wonderful, powerful Word of God? Two things. I have one corporate application and one personal application. Let me give you the first one. The corporate application is the long one. The corporate application is this. We, as a church, we are determined to preach the Word. Let me tell you what I mean by preaching the Word. We are committed to biblical preaching that exposes the people of God to the written Word of God. So this is what we'll do every single week. So whenever you come to this place, you will not have to guess what we will do today. Because have you ever think about it that you, you, you're here pretty much for 105 minutes, I count. But for those 105 minutes, you sat and listened to me talk for 15 min, 50 minutes. That's almost half of your time. Why do you do that? I mean, I'm pretty sure all of you are busy people. You have things to do. You have to take care of your marriage. You have to take care of your kids. You have to take care of your work or essay. But why on earth do you spend 15 minutes listening to someone talk while you, can ha- you have many other options? Let me tell you why. Because we believe this word is alive and active. Because we believe this word exposes our heart. Because we believe this word penetrates our heart in order to heal us. So this is my commitment to you, okay? So what does it mean for us then? I have three things. What does it mean to preach the Word? The first thing is this, that preaching the Word of God will be central to everything that we do in this place. Uh, I've talked to many people that say, today, preaching the Word is no longer relevant. relevant. All you need to do in a track crowd is this, change it to music. Change it to drama. Change it to skit. People love it. It's more entertaining. Okay? It's more appealing to their senses. Okay? This is what I say to it. Drama is great. Skit is great. Music is awesome. But when you come to this place, preaching of the word will be central to everything we do. We will give our utmost attention, time, effort to the preaching of the word because the preaching of the word is what is able to transform life. That's one you need to know. The second thing that you need to understand is this. What does it mean for us to preach the word? Second thing, do not expect self-help sermons from me. Okay? If you have no idea what self-help sermon, let me explain to you. Self-help sermon is basically, uh, they get the word from a kind of book, the kind of book that is very popular on book, um, booksellers. So if you go to booksellers, the number one, the, pretty much the most popular section of the book is called self-help. What does it say? It says it has things like this, you know, seven ways in order to you for you to become successful people, or five ways in order for you have to sex successful marriage, or ten steps in order for you to become a better man. So self help book simply says this: there's something wrong with you, but let me help you. I have the way to do it, and if you just follow my ten step, then 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 you'll be okay. So they fit on human needs, that human understanding, they know there's something wrong with them, and then they give them the solution. The problem is this. It does not work. That's the reason that books after books after books after books is keep re- being written, being edited, another extra step, another extra step, remove that step, add that step. Why? Because they know it does not work. Yet what's funny about it is people keep buying it. And then what's bewildering me is this, and then, Christianity begins to say, hey, people actually buy that thing. So now, you will hear a sermon, self-help sermon, sprinkle with biblical first, here and there, out of context, and now they change it. Five steps in order for you to have successful life with Jesus. Five steps that you can have the best marriage now with Jesus. Seven step, Jesus able to give you peace in life. So now what happened is this. The church buy it, and now, now they add verses out of context. I can tell you, definitely, out of context. Use it out of context. Now say, okay, this is what you need. And people love it. 
People buy it. And if you watch Christian TV, if you watch Christian podcast, if you go to many churches out there, that's what they do. Seven stuff. And people, yeah, come on, let's. And they do it. And they try to apply it. And they're like, how come it does not work? And they get frustrated and they say, fine, the Bible is no longer relevant. It's not working. They leave the church because they miss out on what the Bible is all about. And the third thing is this. Do not expect self-help sermon from me because the third thing, we will make much of Jesus in every sermon. What do I mean? It's connected to the second point. I remember my conversation with a very, very well-known pastor. I will not reveal the name. I asked the pastor, uh, Pastor, how do you do your sermon preparation? And he answered me. This is what I do. I started with the question, what does my people need? And I'm like, are you serious? You started with people's need? Of course, I can't do that. I'm like, wow, awesome. People's need. Because yeah, he's, he's way more senior than me. Like, okay, awesome, awesome. And because the assumption is this, okay? And then I went to a big church conference, a really, really big church conference. And pretty much what they say is this. Church need to, need to preach a relevant message. Church need to answer the people need. And I'm like, are you serious? Because let me tell you what's the problem. If that's what the church is all about, answering your need, let me tell you, I will be the worst pastor you can ever have because I have absolutely no idea what your need is. And even if I do, every single individual have different needs. This person have that need. This person have that need. This person have that need. How am I supposed to answer to people's needs? If my sermon is basically based on answering people's needs, then I have missed out what the Bible is all about. Because this is my deep conviction. And then I'm going to argue for the next five minutes, and then I'm going to finish. This is my argument. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is not about you. It's first and foremost about the Son of God who took on the flesh in order to save you and me. It's about the name of Jesus. So from Genesis to Revelation, all the Bible keep continuing to focus on is the coming of the Son of God and what the Son of God has done. That's the Bible. It's about one person by the name of Jesus. And when you do biblical preaching properly, it points you to that person. It points you to Jesus. And when it points you to Jesus, this is what happened. It's living and active. That word transforms you to be like Jesus. That word somehow exposes your secret sin. That word cuts into your being and reveals to you what needs to be cut out of you. So, here's my example. All of you have different needs. Some of you, should I date Bobby or Billy? Some of you, should I take Commonwealth or Westpac as my job? Some of you, like, should I stay in Sydney or should I go back for good? Some of you, how can I raise my kids? Or some of you have different needs. How can I make my, my, my business better? Some, everyone has different needs, okay? That's where we come. And I'm going to tell you right now, I do not have the answer for you. But let me tell you what I do have. Listen, let me, listen to me. This is what I, what I do have. I have the Word of God that is able to transform you to be like Jesus. And this is what happened. Okay? Let's take one of them. Should I date Bobby or Billy? Okay? That's the question. This is what I have. When you immerse yourself in the Word of God, when you come under the preaching of the Word of God and it's alive and active and it changes you, it cuts sin in your heart, it shows the wickedness of your heart, it exposes you, and at the same time it heals you. This is what happened. Slowly, you begin to desire what Jesus desires. Slowly, you begin to think the way Jesus thinks. Slowly, you begin to want what Jesus wants. Slowly, now everything about your worldview changes. Now the way you see people changes. Now the way you see things changes. Now your community changes. Your friends changes. Everything about you changes. Your world shifted. And now you're, you're what in your mind, what you want to do is, I, know, I love Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. So now my question is this. Should, should you date Bobby or Billy? The answer is maybe neither. Because maybe right now that you have come to be more like Jesus and you come to know your brothers and sisters and you come into a new community, maybe you no longer need Bobby or Billy. Maybe you meet Henry. I'm so not going to miss using him as my sermon illustration. 
Why? Because now everything about you shifted. What you need first and foremost is not what to do in life. What you need first and foremost to understand what this book's about and how it transforms you to be like the Son of God. And when you are transformed to be like the Son of God, want what He wants, desire what He desires, then what? Life works out for you. But the way we do that is not by giving you what you want right now. The way we do it by preach the word. Biblical preaching is speaking for God by exposing the people of God to the written of word of God in context. And when we do that, you're changing. That's my commitment to you. In church, we will preach the word. So if you're looking for the kind of sermon that five things that you can do after you when you leave this place, you're in the wrong place. But I can guarantee you, if you stick with us, if you let the Word of God transform you, you will be like Jesus. And that's what you and I need most. Second thing, personal application, and I'm done. If we believe that, if we believe that our primary need is to be transformed by the Word of God, to be like Jesus, if we truly convince ourselves that what we need is the Word of God, and the only one that can transform us in life and active to make us more like this, the Word of God. Then the second application, this is very, very basic but extremely crucial, is this. Read your Bible. Can we put the quote? I want you to go to go home with this quote, okay? Because I know most of you believe it, but do we really do it? If we want to be like the Word of God in flesh, then we have to immerse ourselves in the written word of God. No other choice. No other solution. If you want to be like Jesus, if your heart desires, I want to be like that, the lover of myself, if you want to be like Jesus, then the only way is that you have to immerse yourself in the written word of God. That's the only way. And I know some of you will say amen to that. Some of you say, yes, believe it. Even after I preach to someone, you get, okay, I'm going to preach it. Call your preach it, pastor. I don't know what to call myself. I forgot. But you know that it's true. You know, you affirm intellectually that everything that I say is true. My question is not whether you affirm whether it's what I say is true or not, but whether you actually believe it. Because if you really believe it, then you will continue to immerse yourself in this book. The Word of God, Genesis to Revelation, all of them are inspired by the Holy Spirit, including Leviticus. Ka, yos, pasa. I read a Bible every day, one verse a day. Okay, here's my thing about it. Okay, good, one verse a day. But I don't think you will be able to understand the verse in its context and what it actually means if you only read one verse. You need to truly understand the Word of God in its context. You really need to understand what God is actually saying through that book. So it's my encouragement I'm done. If it's really your desire to be like Jesus, then the only solution is to continue to jump into the pool and swim. Swim inside the pool. But, but I don't understand. That's okay. Continue to read it because what the Word of God is, what alive and active, it will not fail to accomplish what it set out to do. Will not, 100%. It is the Word of the eternal God. So trust it. Continue to immerse yourself in it. Swim in it. And let me tell you, before you knew it, you're already a step closer to be like Christ. Let's pray. God, um, I know it's not a simple word. But yet, in this simplicity of the word of God, we find, we know that is alive and active that right now even in all our weaknesses that your word is penetrating to our heart exposing the sinfulness of our heart our unbelief and it took the tumors of our unbelief out of us you cut us and it's painful but at the same time the word of God heals us 
and show us that we have a great high priest who took on the form of flesh and died for us so that we can boldly come to the throne of grace. So tonight I want to pray on behalf of my brothers and sisters in this place. Maybe they, some of us tonight, Lord, that um, we've been neglecting the Word of God. We've been neglecting immersing ourselves in the Word of God. I pray that tonight that truly we understand what you want us to do. Simply just to jump into that pool, the written Word of God, and just swim in it. I pray tonight by the grace of God that we will be able to make that commitment to say, Lord, I want to immerse myself in your word. Not what Piper said, not what Keller said, not what Yossi said, not what any other said, but what you say because your word is alive and active. It has the power to change us to be like you. And that's what we need in life. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you continue the work that have you begun in us. Pray for Roxy and International that we may be faithful to the Word. Pray that whenever we're tempted to shift to the right and left, whenever we are tempted to just to trade other things that seems more relevant, that people more love than your Word, I pray that you rebuke us and remind us to continue to preach the Word of God. So I pray that you shape us to be more like you, Lord. I pray that we be known as a church that loves Jesus and want to be like Jesus. And I ask this in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.